began with factory racing efforts in the aftermath of the Second World War. Germany had been banned from international motor racing following the cease of hostilities. But Mercedes had traditionally placed a high value on motorsports in development of new and better road cars. It was no surprise that as soon as the motorsport ban was lifted in 1950, that the factory quickly moved to establish a racing department, despite the company being a long way off of financial stability. The former racing driver, Alfred Neubauer, had run the team successfully before the war, and he was chosen again to lead it afterwards. He was renowned for his organisational skills and reliance on precision preparation. In charge of research and development was Rudolf Uhlenhaupt, and company chief engineer Fritz Nallinger supported the team from above. The limited finances of the department didn't stretch to a new racing car just yet. Three pre-war W154 V12 racers were scraped together and the team began training at the Nürburgring in 1950. The goal was to enter the Indianapolis 500 in the US to gain the company precious exposure to the US market at a time when war ravaged European economies meant people could scarce afford new cars, let alone luxury brands. The team would first participate in the Formula Libre of Buenos Aires Grand Prix, followed by the Eve of Peron race, both in February 1951. Two cars were entered into both races, and despite carburetor trouble on both occasions, achieved second and third place both times, losing out only to Jose Gonzalez in the new supercharged Ferrari 166FL. These races saw the first appearance of Argentina's own Juan Manuel Fangio, alongside German drivers Hermann Lang and Karl Kling. To achieve these results in 13-year-old cars, with a race team that had mostly never competed at international level, on its first outing was no mean feat. However, it was decided that the W154s simply were not competitive, and the Indy 500 entry was withdrawn. Mercedes knew they now needed to develop an up-to-date racing car. But the current formula was due to expire after the 1953 season. Keen to run in 1952 and 53, resources were allocated to developing a car in the outgoing formula. It would have to use as many production car components as possible to minimise the loss of finances that would be incurred by its short useful lifespan. At this point, resources were also allocated to developing a car to compete from 1954 onwards. This car would eventually be the 8-cylinder W196 and the derived 300 SLR, which dominated in Grand Prix for the 1954 and 55 seasons, took Sterling Moss to victory in the 1955 Mille Miglia and was ultimately involved in the tragic crash at Le Mans, which spelled the Mercedes factory withdrawal from racing. For the 1952 car, the racing department looked to the new luxury 300S model. More than simply a shortened coupe version of the 300 saloon luxury car, the 300S boasted a higher compression ratio in its 3 litre inline 6 M188 engine and three Solex 40 PBJC carburetors to achieve 150 horsepower, compared to 115 horsepower in the saloon. The 300S was the absolute pinnacle of what Mercedes offered in the 1950s and cost 34,500 Deutschmarks, over 10,000 more than the 300 saloon which itself was twice the price of a Cadillac Coupe de Ville in the 1950s. The racing team took the engine, gearbox and suspension from the 300S to become the basis of their stopgap racing car. The 300S was a tall car and the engine was also tall and heavy. It was never designed to go racing. To compensate for this, the car would have to be ultra light. Uhlenhout's team took inspiration from Jaguar and Aston Martin race entries and Franz Roller designed a space frame tubular chassis which was incredibly strong despite weighing less than 50 kilos. This space frame was the reason for the gullwing doors, as the frame came up too high for conventional ones. Paul Brack, working under Carl Wilford, designed an aerodynamic aluminium body, and both open and closed versions of the car were produced. The problem of the tall engine was overcome by canting it to 50 degrees and offsetting it by several inches. Mercedes had done this for another racing car pre-war, the W163. The engine was redesignated M194 to match the chassis code of the new car, W194. The engine retained the three Solex carburetors of the 300S, but now produced 168 horsepower. It was mounted behind the front axle for better weight distribution. The finished car weighed no more than 900 kilos and was to be known as 300SL 
300 for 3 litre and SL for sports or super light. 10 chassis would be produced. Its performance during the 1952 season was impressive, especially considering the carburetted engine made less horsepower than contemporary Ferraris and Jaguars. The team raced at the 1952 Milli Miglia in May, being narrowly beaten by a Ferrari entry, followed by the Prix de Berne, where the team took first and second place. Next came Le Mans, where the car's gullwing doors were modified to be bigger, in case the smaller doors on the early cars impeded entry during the traditional Le Mans start, where drivers would run and jump into their cars to start the race. Three cars entered. Hermann Lang teamed with Fritz Reis, Theo Helfrich teamed with Norbert Niedermeyer, and Karl Kling teamed with Hans Klink. Neubauer instructed all drivers to take the race fast but steady, rather than getting drawn into duels with rival cars. Strict timing was enforced, with all cars racing with a clock and a list of refueling times. This paid off for the team. While the Kling and Klenk car retired with dynamo trouble, the two remaining 300 SLs proved to be reliable. Pierre Levet had been leading by four laps in a Talbot Lego T26 when the engine blew up, leaving the two Mercedes to take first and second place. Later in the year, the team entered the sports car race which accompanied the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. The 300 SLs swept the board, but the team had also brought with them two cars equipped with Roots-type superchargers instead of the carburetors found on the standard W194s. These were designated W197 and both suffered overheating. They were not seen on a racetrack again. The big finish for the 1952 season was to be the Carrera Panamericana. This would be an excellent opportunity for exposure to US buyers. The 1953 race was the third of its kind and held over 1,984 miles, with terrain ranging from high mountain passes to stretches of sea level. The 300 SLs had their engines bored out to 3.1 litres for the occasion. The team practised in Italy to best approximate the climate, especially where carburation is concerned, as adjustment is required based on altitude. Nine tyre dumps were established along the course, so that the cars would have appropriate rubber for each section. A 300 SL driven by Kling with Klenk navigating took victory with an average speed of 102 miles an hour. Despite a vulture crashing through the windscreen into Klenk's face, knocking him unconscious briefly. He told Kling to maintain speed for 43 miles to the next tyre stop, where a new windscreen was fitted with metal bars to stop any more birds getting in. The team were the first to use a set of pre-prepared pace notes, now standard practice in rallying, which allowed the co-driver to quickly communicate the upcoming course to the driver in shorthand. Following the year of success in 1952, Mercedes management decided that 300 SL had been successful enough. There would be no works team for 1953. Instead, they would focus on getting the Grand Prix racer ready for the 1954 season. This would be where the story of the 300 SL ended, were it not for Max Hoffman. Stuttgart had no intention of producing a production version of this stopgap racer. Maximilian Hoffman was Austrian born, and in his younger years enjoyed some success as a racing driver. He had moved to the US around the outbreak of the Second World War, and by 1947 he saw an opportunity to import European cars. By 1948, Hoffman was the Eastern US importer for Jaguar. He watched the progress of the 300 SL keenly during 1952, and was convinced there was a market for a production sports car in the US. He proposed the idea to Mercedes management. General Director Fritz Kunecke was keen, Chief Engineer Nellinger was not. The racing department were already busy preparing for 1954. Hoffman convinced the directors by placing a firm order for a thousand cars, and the production department was set to work. There had been a sports car in development since 1952, although the 190SL carried an inline four engine and was designed to provide the customer with a taste of racing cars and styling more than a performance. The 300SL coupe was chosen to be the basis of the production car rather than the open top version, partly because the coupes had been seen more during 1952 and partly because it would be more practical from an engineering standpoint, with a coupe providing rigidity. There was a brief experiment with making the car body out of fibreglass to keep costs down, but this was dropped after one prototype. The first metal bodied prototype was ready in January 1954, and the finished car debuted at the New York Motor Show in February, just a month later. New York marked a departure from the usual Mercedes debuts at Geneva or Frankfurt 
but was considered appropriate for the intended market of the car. Production began in August 1954. Visually, the car was considerably different to the 1952 Works Racers, which had not been constructed with style in mind. There had in fact been a prototype designed and built for the 1953 season. Engineer Rudolf Uhlenhaupt, defying the Board of Management's decision and building a car, numbered chassis 11. This car replaced the Solex carburetors of the 1952 car with indirect injection and had a decreased track width to reduce drag, an upgraded rear differential and better weight distribution. The car's power output went up by 40 horsepower to 214. The wheelbase was also shortened and the now controversial swing axle was installed. The car was enough of an improvement to win over Nallinger, but before it could go much further, Hoffman's order came in for a thousand road cars. The Finnish 300SL shared much with the 1953 prototype, notably the fuel injection, the first fitted to a production road car. And also from a styling standpoint, the now familiar air intake with large Mercedes star is evident on this prototype. The production 300SL road car was designated W198. All cars were hand built on a special production line at Sindelfingen. Strakes were added over the wheel arches to compensate for the short wheelbase and big wheels to give the car a sleeker look. The window glass was mounted in detachable frames, as there was no space to allow them to wind up or down, and the general public wouldn't be expected to put up with the same discomfort the racing drivers had to endure. While the racing cars had all aluminium bodies, the production car shells were steel construction to bring down cost and improve durability. There was a special lightweight version with an all aluminium body available briefly in early 1956, although only 29 of them were built. Doors, bonnet and boot lid remained aluminium however. Engines were modified from the racing spec. The upgraded camshaft was reverted back to standard specification from 300S and the engine was fitted with a dry sump system so the engine oil reservoir was separate which helped reduce engine height and to keep the oil cool under strenuous conditions. This was a racing feature which ironically hadn't made it into the W194 race cars earlier. The car was fitted with the Bosch indirect fuel injection as the 50 degree cant of the engine made tuning carburetors extremely difficult. The performance was excellent. A 300 SL would pull cleanly from 15 miles an hour in top gear. Although, if left to idle for too long in traffic, the rich fuel mixture would foul the spark plugs and cause a misfire. This could be burned off by a bit of high speed driving. The fuel injected car still retained a manual choke and a reserve fuel pump to help with hot starting the engine. Transmission and running gear still came from the 300S, but larger Alfin type fin drum brakes were also added to aid braking. These were coupled to a servo, initially a Treadlevac suction servo, but it was found that if this failed, the driver was left with no brake force at all. An ATE T50 vacuum servo quickly replaced the Treadlevac. Braking was still far from perfect. The car had a habit of locking one wheel at a time when braking from high speed. The chassis from the 300S was modified to have a slightly wider front and narrower rear track, and upper wishbones were drilled out to make it lighter. The double pivot swing axle rear setup from the 300 saloon was almost unchanged, but again far from ideal for a light sports car, and the 300SL could be prone to power oversteer. Some late production cars were delivered from factory with Michelin X radial tyres, which made the oversteer even worse. A do not exceed 120 miles an hour sticker was added on the speedometer. Of course, if you wanted to exceed 120 miles an hour, you could do it without difficulty. Standard production cars produced 195 horsepower at 5,800 RPM, and customers had three rear differential ratio options, depending on whether they wanted maximum acceleration, or maximum top speed, or a compromise between the two. 0 to 60 was achieved in around 8.5 seconds, and 0 to 100 in about 12.5. The average medium sized saloon in the mid 1950s would usually boast a top speed of around 70 miles an hour, and a 3 litre luxury car might just top 100 miles an hour. The 300 SL as a road going car was really in a league of its own. Interiors on the works racing cars were surprisingly comfortable. This was due to Neubauer's belief that comfortable racing drivers would perform better especially in the endurance racing. However, the cloth interior of the racers was replaced with leather upholstery and cabin soundproofing was added. The car still remained strictly two-seater, with the space behind the seats reserved for luggage.
The spare wheel took up nearly all of the boot space anyway. Mercedes provided a fitted set of two-piece luggage to match the customer's interior at extra cost. The dashboard was neatly laid out, and the passenger even got their own horn button. Ingress and egress remained just as difficult as on the racing cars, so the hinged steering wheel was retained. Steering wheel and gear selector were matching white ivory coloured, and all cars were supplied in left-hand drive. The cant of the engine made any practical right-hand drive conversion very difficult. The Gullwing Mercedes was in production for just three years, and 1,400 units were delivered. The company was convinced of the value of the car, enough to develop an improved version. This would be the 300 SL Roadster that would succeed the Gullwing Coupe in 1957. Stuttgart had identified certain design shortcomings in the Gullwing, not least the Gullwing doors themselves, which despite being an iconic design feature, did make getting in and out very difficult. The unpredictable rear end behaviour previously mentioned, the lack of luggage space in the boot, and the fact that the car's largest market, the state of California, really would have preferred an open top car. Significant modifications to the space frame were needed to achieve these improvements, and the factory didn't waste time. The first prototype roadsters were spotted as early as mid-1956. The main alterations involved a lower centre section to permit smaller sills and larger doors. Diagonal struts were added for strength, and modification was made at the rear to allow the spare wheel to be mounted under the floor rather than in the boot, although this did mean that the fuel tank had to get smaller. A coil spring was added horizontally on the rear swing axle setup, just above the differential. This spring helped over bumpy sections of road to give stability. A wider front and rear track with fatter tyres meant that handling was vastly improved. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for the brakes, which were no better despite a bigger servo. In March 1961, an all-disc setup replaced the old drum system, and the car finally had a good braking system. The modifications made the car heavier, and US spec cars had a raised compression ratio from 8.55 to 1 to 9.5 to 1 made possible by readily available 100 octane fuel. This gave the car an extra 10 horsepower. The optional lower 3.89 to 1 differential ratio from the Gullwing was made standard to improve acceleration. Top speeds were not up to those achieved by the Gullwing, with 137 miles an hour achievable with the 3.89 to 1 ratio. The folding soft top was responsible for much of the increased weight. This could be stowed neatly in a well behind the front seats. The car also had winding windows, which meant it was not strictly a roadster and in fact a cabriolet. From September 1958, customers could option a detachable metal hardtop and also a permanent fixed hardtop, although this was not a popular option. In terms of styling, there were some differences beyond the cabin roof. The front lights on the Gullwing had been round units, while on the roadster these became the longer light units just coming into fashion at Stuttgart, which incorporated indicators, headlights and fog lights. Inside, the instrument cluster now had vertical strips between the two main dials and the tilting steering wheel had been done away with. It was also no longer invariably delivered in ivory colour, and had a chrome horn ring in place. The new focus on safety at Mercedes saw switches recessed into the dashboard. The roadster was quieter and more refined than the Gullwing, but perhaps lacked some of the competition aura of the older car. The factory built only one racing version of the roadster. This was the 300 SLS, of which two were produced to compete in the 1957 Sports Car Club of America National Circuit. These featured a solid cover over the passenger seat, a low-profile racing screen in place of a full-width and height windscreen, a driver's seat roll bar, a custom car with engine air intake, and a lack of front and rear bumpers. These and other modifications lowered the vehicle weight from 1420 kilos to 1040 kilos. Engine output was increased by 20 horsepower to 235 horsepower. Driver Paul O'Shea won the title for the company. Only 1,858 roadsters were built over six years of production, compared with the Gullwing's 1,400 in just three years. The cars were never cheap, but the roadsters had commanded a 12% premium price over the Gullwing's. In 1961, Jaguar brought out the E-Type. It was cheaper, faster and arguably better styled. Mercedes knew it was time to wind down production. The company had quit racing after the 1955 Le Mans disaster, so there was no longer a racing car to base a sports car on, and developing one from scratch for the low volumes expected was out of the question. 
When the W113 Pagoda appeared in 1963 to take up the SL badge from the 300 SL and the smaller four-cylinder 190 SL, it was a sophisticated and attractive tourer, but did not have the brute power or racing pedigree that the 300 SL carried. The 300 SL Goldwing and Roadster did much for the image of Mercedes-Benz. Before them, the company was associated, in America especially, with staid, reliable, maybe even dull saloon cars. There is little doubt that the 300 SL helped solidify the brand in the realms of desirable and exotic. A long list of famous owners didn't hurt this, including Tony Curtis, Pablo Picasso, Sophia Loren, Romy Schneider, Clark Gable, Glenn Ford, Briggs Cunningham, Paul Newman, Yul Brenner, Ralph Lauren, Frank Lloyd Wright, and King Abdullah II of Jordan. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and let us know which other historical videos you'd like to see.